we are going to be moving into a Christmas sermon today. We're taking a book break from the book of John the next couple weeks. And so we're going to actually be all over. We're going to be in the book of Luke a little bit later, Luke chapter 1. But then we'll be jumping around before we get to that point. You know, this last week, yeah, you kind of wonder how to open. Obviously, it was kind of a traumatic week nationally, not full of a lot of good news, barring, of course, the Hinkle Web. So we don't know. But sometimes there's those times in life when you were just reminded how dark our world can still be. And it's always that way if we really look at the news, both what's reported and what's not reported, what we know and what we miss. And it becomes very clear clear to us that this world really does need a Savior. And without, without God's restraining hand, without His active presence to redeem human hearts, that we would be in an utterly lost and dark world. And so it's very appropriate at Christmas time that, that we get to look and turn our gaze back on the Savior and to consider here is a person who has come to redeem and to save lost and fallen people. And we need Him just as much today as they needed Him that first Christmas. And sometimes you feel like you needed Him more, but the human heart has always been the same, lost without Christ. But Christ came to save sinners, and we are so grateful that in His mercy, He looked at this broken world and sent, the Father sent the Son, to redeem us, to save us, and to put us back together for a future world, a new heaven and a new earth, that where we can live with Him forever. I was, I, I remember, I was thinking, you know, when I was, obviously, this last week was unfolding, and the news is coming in, I said, sometimes I just don't understand what God puts up with human beings. I just don't. I mean, you look at, on your best day, you look at the hardness of your own heart and those moments that maybe you don't share with another person, and think, why, why does God still put up with me? And thinking it would be very just because God is good for Him just to wipe this whole planet clean. But if He doesn't want to destroy it, then He needs to save it. He needs to save us. And the good news is both He who is the judge and both He who is the Savior are united in that same person. But it's our choice on how we get to meet Him. So we need to think this Christmas season, who is Jesus and how will we respond? Will we know him as a righteous judge who cannot tolerate wickedness? Or will we know him as the Savior who came to bear your sins, that you might be brought to peace with him? And that's what Christmas is about. The reconciliation of God and man. That God looked down on his creation and offered them peace. So let's go ahead and let's pray, and then we'll jump right in this morning at our first of, our, of two Christmas sermons. Lord, we come before you, and we stand in awe when we consider what you were willing to do for humanity. That you were willing to leave heaven, that you were willing to lower yourself. So much further than we can ever imagine. So that you could restore and save lost people. I pray you would impress that on us this morning. And we would be caught up not just in the wonder of the season. But in the very realization of who you are and what you have done. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we read up here. Actually, we'll skip this verse. We're going to come back to it, though. That the Bible has predicted a Savior is coming. We did a Christmas play where a king is coming to town. Some of you came out and saw it. It's like a king is coming to town. And the silly townsfolk in this children's Christmas play get all confused. And they're like, a king is coming. And some of them think it's a king of England. Some of them, king of England? King of somewhere. Uh, it's a queen of England today, so I don't know how they got confused. But your pastor is always confused, so it's probably not that big of a stretch. Some of them thought it was the king of the jungle, so they're expecting King Kong. Some of them thought King Tut. 
Some of them thought the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley, is really not dead. He is coming back. <laughs> and the buzz. And maybe you've been in that type of situation where you've met somebody either personally or from afar, somebody really famous. Like, the person is coming. This person is coming to our town. I want to see them. I want to shake their hand. I want to meet them. And just the buzz that can go around with that. Well, Jesus was indeed the king, and he was the Messiah, and he was predicted for a long time. Because that ever since the world had fallen into sin, the revealed plan had been that a Savior was coming. It had always been in God's plan, obviously. He knew this. But it had been revealed to humanity right after the fall. You get to Genesis chapter 3, and there are already the predictions and prophecies that God is going to reach out to his fallen creation. Now, it's unve unveiled, kind of like an onion in layers. You get a little bit, a big, small glimpse, and it expands. And over time, the Bible gives more and more details of this coming Messiah. So this was not just some accident, this was not some afterthought, but God's intention for humankind that he could save them and restore them to himself. And as soon as the fall had happened, that we read there in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God speaking to Eve, says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, speaking specifically of the devil and, and Eve's offspring, this offspring. He, that one, shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And this saying, which by itself might seem kind of cryptic, is that looking ahead to that time when Jesus Christ would come, conquering death and the devil and hell and everything with it, and his heel would be pierced. And we see his afflictions as we think ahead to, to Easter and Good Friday. But sin would be dealt a mortal blow. The first hint of this Redeemer in Scripture. And as time goes on, we see more and more as God reveals. In Isaiah 9:7, it says, Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. See, there are a lot, of, a lot of narrowing down before this because God had come to a man named Abram and called him out of his people and sent him to a new land and established a covenant with him and said, and you will be a blessing to all nations. And basically saying, through the line of Abraham, the Messiah will come. And over time, that was narrowed again to the tribe of Judah out of his descendants, not all of his descendants, but now it would be the tribe of Judah within the descendants of Abraham, saying the Messiah will come from this line. And as the Judah, one of the particular families of Judah, the house of David, became kings. And God promised to David, your throne would endure forever. And out of your throne and out of your seed, which we'll talk again a, a little bit later, will come the Messiah. And we see this in Isaiah, and this is kind of wrapping up some of those things, this narrowing of the focus. But he will come, the Messiah will come, the perfect king, who is more than a king, but also the redeemer. And then we gather by piecing these together. And he will establish a kingdom that will never end. And as Chris was just sharing a few moments, ago, I mean, J.W. was sharing over the offering. We're looking forward to that time for him to establish his kingdom forever. We're looking forward to that day where there will be more death, no more death, or crying, or suffering, or pain. We're looking forward to a time of justice and a righteous rule. But he has already come, and we see who it is that he will be. Jeremiah, this is the verse we skipped over at the very beginning, same verse. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David... A branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. 
Now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. Which is so fitting because the only way we are righteous is because of our Lord. And we thank God that he can impute his righteousness on us while taking our sins to the cross. But the Messiah, the descendant of David. And of course there's many more. We're just going very quickly this morning. In Isaiah 7.14 we read, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And Emmanuel which means God with us. And this is a very important prophecy because we find through other places in Scripture that sin, the penalty of sin is passed from father to children. This makes me feel very glad as a, a, a man. Because when Garrett's misbehaving, my wife can look at me and say, I told you it was your fault. So, uh, and it's true. And so in this virgin birth, what we see that God has a descendant of humankind that has been able to avoid the curse. It's very interesting, if you, you read just a minute ago in Genesis 3.15, he says to, speaking of Eve, between your seed and there will be this hostility between the devil and sin. It's the only place in the Bible, to all of my studying and through reading other people, that it calls it the seed of woman. is in reference to Jesus Christ. Other times in the Bible, it calls it the seed of man. They always refer to the man's contribution to the child as the seed. But in this, they see the seed of woman and just an allusion to this virgin birth that Jesus Christ will be born. And his birth will be unlike anything else. Yet giving us another hint and another understanding of, of who he is. And he will be called God with us. And he even gives us a place. But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. And again, we see just who Christ is. It's eternally, the eternal Son becoming now part of this creation. And the place where He will be born. A place that we know very commonly today. Bethlehem. But at that time, it was just a small place. Not really worth mentioning. By the way, the Ephrathah is because there are actually two Bethlehems. Just meant house of bread. And that's where Jesus was born, the ancestral home of his forefather David. And if we were going to break this down, which we don't have enough time this morning, the Bible even gives us a time frame of when he would be born. Because in Daniel chapter 9, it says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, there should be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublesome times. And if we went through all of Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy, you can see he even gave parameters. And at the time of Jesus being born, there's a messianic expectation. Because God has did not left us a secret, but his plan to send a Messiah. And yet, it had been a quiet time for about 400 years. A little bit more. Because since the writing of the book of Malachi, there had been what we call the 400 years of silence. Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. A book written to the exiles return, encouraging them to live righteous lives. Encouraging them to be ready for the Messiah. Because in those closing words of the book of Malachi, the author is writing, whether Malachi is his name or his title, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. He has said, Make sure your hearts are right with God. Nation of the Messiah, because I'm going to send Elijah to prepare the way. And it could be a time of great blessing or a time of judgment. And into the silence, we're going to find it is quickly shattered in the temple in Jerusalem 
I'm going to say one afternoon, I don't really know the time of day. As a priest named Zachariah goes into the temple. So if you have your Bibles with me, let's go ahead and turn to, to Luke. And we're going to start off in chapter 1 of verse, verse 5. And read uh, several of these verses. So you can imagine, nothing's been written for 400 years. It's very quiet. You're going along in your normal life, and in this case, Zachariah's life, his religious duties, trying to live the best you could, and the following happens. Starting in 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife, wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. So it was, while he was serving as a priest before God in the order of his division, According to the custom of the priesthood, his lot fell to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people was praying outside the hour of incense. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Kind of, you hear Malachi echoing in this pronouncement as, as I just read aloud to you. It's worth when you go home, turning back to the last few words of Malachi and looking at this angelic announcement, you see coming together, and you might be excited, and you might be kind of dumbfounded, but Zacharias, as we read, he takes it a slightly different way. And Zacharias said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is well advanced in years. Now I just want to say something. Jesus Christ seems to have a sense of humor. I mean, he puts up with us. And he designed some really cool looking animals, like a giraffe and a platypus, and I don't know, from my recollection, I, I do believe that God has a sense of humor. Obviously, He is, deserves all honor and respect and glory, and He will be zealous for His namesake, and so we don't want to overstep those bounds. Uh, but when the messengers came to Abraham and Sarah, and Sarah laughed, He said, okay, fine, you get to name Isaac laughter. To me, that's just kind of funny. Angels, on the other hand, don't seem to have the same sense of humor. If you ever meet an angel of, of the Lord, and He says God is going to do this, don't laugh. Okay, they seem to be very zealous for God's honor. Because we go on and we see that the angel answered him, verse 19, and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. And the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he could not speak to them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. So it was, as soon as the days of his service were completed, that he departed to his own house. Now after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and she hid herself five months, saying, Thus the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among the people. So here we have it, an unlikely, an angelic message to an unlikely person to give birth to the child. Because God, once again, is letting him know that he is in control and is on his time. And let nobody mistake that this is not 
his doing. He goes to the man Zacharias, this faithful priest, and his wife, who is also a very godly woman, but have been unable to have children. And they're past the age of having children. And while he's serving in the temple, sends Gabriel to send the message, you are going to give birth to the person who is coming in the spirit and power of Elijah, that prophet who will precursor the Messiah. It's a divine purpose. It's a divine birth. And he's told that your child, even from the womb, will be full of the Holy Spirit. It's a unique child with a special purpose. A purpose to turn people's hearts to God. So he will be the one, as we know it, who will call out to the people from the wilderness, baptizing people, saying, repent, because he acts as at the tree. The Messiah is coming, and we need to be ready. Is that John? And these are his parents. We always think of John as maybe a crazy kind of wild man. Maybe that's how you see him. He's dressed in camel skins. He's eating off the land. He has no, seems to have no social, normal Ideas of how to conduct himself. Instead of being polite, he's just like, You, who warned you to come? Who warned you of the coming wrath? But you look at his parents. They're very upper crust, respectable people. They said, John is going to be your child. And he's going to be full of the Holy Spirit. And we do see that, of course, Zacharias doubts. And so Gabriel says, That's fine. You don't have to talk until the child is born. I will just remove your voice from you. Some of you parents have wished that Gabriel would visit your house from time to time. <laughs> but we see then a little bit later, and we'll skip ahead to chapter, chapter 2, or chapter 1. If you jump down to verse 57... Now Elizabeth's time, full time, came for her to be delivered, and she brought forth a son. When her neighbors and relatives heard how the Lord had shown great mercy to her, they rejoiced with her. So it was on the eighth day that they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him by the name of his father, Zacharias. Traditionally, at that time, you didn't get named in the hospital. You waited till the day of circumcision. It was like a naming day as well. This is when you're presented with your name. Zacharias can't speak. They think, well, this is going to be little Zach Jr. Zach knows that what the angel has said is true at this point. He's not been able to talk for a while. He has now seen his wife become great with child, deliver, and here it is. He remembers the words of the angel who says, and you will call him John. And his mother answered and said, no, he will be called John. But they said to her, there's no one among your relatives who is called by this name. So they made signs to his father what he would have him called. They're looking at the mother and say, Elizabeth doesn't know. Obviously, Zacharias wants us to be Zach Jr. Any of you in here a junior? Any of you have a junior? Yeah. You know, the only problem with having a junior is when they get in trouble at school. It, it reflects on both their names, right? I know this because uh, my, my uh, wife comes from a long line of John Shellhammers. When her brother got suspended, was it, one time? I don't know. He wasn't suspended, that was just me? Okay. Uh, your pastor got suspended once, but... Uh, <laughs> you think something about water balloons in a lunchroom, you know. I don't know. They kind of frown upon that. But uh, he said, you know, when he messes up at school, it reflects on my name. That's probably why they named me Troy. My dad said the original Gary Basham got enough trouble all by himself. But they go to Zacharias and they say to him, what would, you, what would you have him to be called? Verse 63. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote saying, His name is John. So they all marveled. Immediately his mouth was open and his tongue was loosed and he spoke praising God. Then fear came on all who dwelt around them. And these sayings were discussed throughout the hill country of Judea. And all those who heard them kept them in their hearts saying, What kind of child will this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. They didn't really realize what was happening yet. But God was sending his son. And we skipped over the, the part that the angel Gabriel has had a second mission. He's already gone before John was born. To Mary, up in Nazareth, this young woman 
a teenage girl who's engaged, not married, and says that you will conceive a child. To which her reaction is very ordinary. How can this be since I've never been with a man? And says, what will happen upon you is by the Holy Spirit. Because what God has begun to reveal to his people is that the Savior is coming. And at this point in the story, the Savior is already here. And this child will proclaim his ministry and ready the hearts of the people. Really, we have a lot in common with John in terms of our purpose. That's our job. It's not to be the Messiah, but it's to prepare to let people know about the Messiah. And that's our great commission that we are, we are to make disciples and to get people acquainted with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Savior of the world. Jesus has indeed come. And He's coming again. And we lift up His name and want to tell people about our great Lord and Savior. A little bit of other background before we get to next week's in the book of Matthew and the book of Luke, we see a, a few of those really interesting reading that some of you probably do. Some of these are the ones that, you know, there, there's just a lot wrong in between my ears, and you guys know that if you've been here any length of time. Things that I think are funny that aren't. Um, but I always used to like when I was a youth pastor, and it probably hasn't ended when you're doing reading, Bible readings, going around a circle. You know, and if you're ever in one of those and you don't want to read, just let the person next to you know. But sometimes I'd count out on purpose and I'd be like, oh, hey, yeah, Jeremy, can you read verses, uh, Luke chapter 3, verses 23 through 37, 38? Like, oh, yeah, sure. And then not knowing, of course, I'd just send him right to one of the genealogies with all these wonderful names. By the way, if you ever get one of those names you don't know how to pronounce it, just say it with conviction. No one else knows anyways. I mean, a few Hebrew scholars, maybe, one or two in the entire building. But we get this genealogy. We actually get one in Matthew chapter 1, too. And it starts off in Matthew. It says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Perez begot Hezron, Hezron begot Ram, Ram begot Abednego. Aminadab begot Nishan, Nishan begot Simon, and he goes on and on. And Eliezer begot Matan, and Matan begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called the Christ. And then you get to uh, Luke. You have a similar genealogy, a lot of it's the same, and then it branches off. Now Jesus himself began the ministry at about 30 years of age, being, it was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Eli, the son of Matat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Jana, the son of Yosef, the son of Mathaniah, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum. And we have these two genealogies of Jesus Christ. And genealogies were very important to the Jewish people, not, not in terms of you know, one of the many special favorites with God, but they knew what tribe they were. It's, it's not necessarily like here. I'm guessing that very few of you have one ethnicity. There might be a few of you in here said, oh yeah, I, I'm German. I'm Irish. You know, I'm, you know, Indian. I'm Russian. Well, pick, insert. But most of us are kind of like, oh yeah, my dad is Irish and German, and my mom is Swedish, and we don't really know where the rest of the family comes from. That's how, right, that's how a lot of us are here. But it was very important in their, in their tribal settings. It was the way they were bound, not bound to the land so much, but had um, heritage rights of the land, and especially when it came to the tribes of Levi. And if you were related to a king, well, that, even today, that's pretty cool, right? You can research your genealogy, and you just don't tell anybody about the horse thieves and the dirt farmers and say, oh, I'm related to this guy who's a prince of Luxembourg back in the 13th century, so you better treat me better. Well, we, we like those type of things. They're interesting. But to the Jewish identity, this was a very important thing. One, it showed that this line that Joseph, you go to Matthew number one, he was the rightful king of Israel. 
What an amazing thing. He, had things been different, had the people not been gone astray, it seems to be that he would have been the king. This, this carpenter in a, in, a, in a faraway city in northern Galilee, eking out a living, should have been a king. He was the heir of the throne of David. But most conservative Bible scholars, they say that's what Matthew is. It's Joseph's genealogy. And Luke, who does a very formal genealogy, most conservative Bible scholars are going to say, this is Mary's. You know, she also was a descendant of David. And you go through, she was of the bloodline. You go, well, that's really cool. So Jesus was a descendant of David on both sides. He has this legal claim to the throne. Because incidentally, I looked this up again just to confirm it, in Judaism, that adoption was practiced. But if a child was adopted, they weren't considered as adopted. They were just considered as your child. As well it should be. But in terms of legal rights, when Joseph took Jesus as his son and raised him as his son, that is now his heir. Regardless of him. So by that point, Jesus has become the legal heir of the throne of Israel. But there's also this thing that happened in the Old Testament. When Manasseh and others came, that God spoke and said, your line will not exist forever. I'm removing you from the throne. Because a lot of sin had crept into the descendants of David. Well, Solomon introduced idolatry and all of his, those following. They did a lot of us other horrible things. So you're like, how can the prophecy now that God has said your throne's going to exist forever, but you've also said these kings won't have the throne, but the legal right has still been tracked even since the return from Babylon through Zerubbabel and others, that the throne is still going through this line. But God says, I have over here another descendant of David who's reckoned through, not through Solomon, but through another descendant of David named Nathan. And one of his great, great, great granddaughters is going to marry one of his great, great, great grandsons. And the child that is miraculously conceived on her will be adopted, getting the full legal rights and having the bloodline and coming together. It's just another instance of how God, none of this happened by accident. And you could not plan this if you tried, it, it goes so far beyond our capabilities even to reckon it in our minds. But when we've been reading, as we, as we went back here, of these prophecies of the Messiah and the Prince, and saying, the Lord will give you a sign to the Virgin, but that it will be a righteous branch of David, and it will sit on His throne. All the prophecies come together in Jesus Christ. God's plan will not be thwarted. And many times, when times are tough and we can't see what's going to happen, maybe you wonder, does God really know what's going on? But God is in control. And the world is going its own rebellious, sinful way. But God's arm is not too short to save. And nothing has escaped His attention. And just as He sent His Son into this dark world the first time, when we look ahead, it all ultimately was pointing to the cross. Which it's, I, I kind of call the real Christmas tree. Because that's why Jesus came. Was to make peace with you and I. And our Creator. In Galatians chapter 4 we read. Verse 4. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth a son. Born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoptions as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth His Spirit and of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. I hope this Christmas is a great Christmas for you. Not because of family or gifts or food or decorations but because Jesus Christ came to save you. Jesus Christ came to offer Himself in our place that we might receive His righteousness and be with Him forever. Let's pray. God, we thank You so much as we've just looked at all these different pieces this morning of a plan 
and history paths and eternity paths. Of so many details which you brought perfectly together. But of your heart, Lord, which found, found a mercy and a desire to save people which had wandered from you. And so, God, we say thank you. And I pray you would give us your joy and just a, a gratitude for what you have done for us. May it change us and consume us and make us useful in your hands. We say the same in Jesus' name. Amen.